this is important. In this day and age, this is an important subject. Psalm 9113, it's the prayer protection. A lot of this is out of the book called the prayer protection, by, written by Joseph Prince. We sell it back in the bookstore. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under your feet. There's no question that the world is a fallen place and the devil is the God of this world. Are you aware of that? The devil is the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 in the New American Standard. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He is called the God of this world. 1 Peter 5.8, it says to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, who's your adversary? The devil. There is a devil. He has one-third of the angels. They're now called demons. All right? And, you know, a lot of denominations, a lot of churches pay no attention to this, but this is very prevalent in the Bible. Uh, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walked about seeking whom he may devour. And we're not called to cower in fear. He may be the ruler of this world. In Christ, we have authority over him. Yes. And I know you guys know this. Yes. We have authority to tread upon the lion, the cobra, the adder, the serpent, the scripture we just read, the dragon. The Bible calls him the dragon, the devil, the dragon, numerous times. Um, also in Psalm 91, it talks about the snare of the fowler and the noise and pestilence. We will not be afraid of his snare. And so we've covered a lot of this, but our role in this increasingly dangerous world isn't to be passive and indifferent. We're not called to be sitting ducks waiting to be devoured by the roaring lion. Uh, let's go to Judges 14.5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared against him. What would you do if you were facing off with a young lion? Psychologists tell us there are three things, three possible responses that are instinctively triggered when a person is unexpectedly thrust into this kind of situation. You fight, take flight, or freeze. There's three things you're going to do. What do you think your response would be? But what Samson did on instinct, if you look at it, Judges 14, 6, the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. He rent that lion as you would rent a baby goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he did not go home and tell his father or mother either. All right. I don't know why they added that, but the hunter came at Samson and found itself hunted. Interesting that it was a lion. And when Samson was walking by that spot at a later date where he'd killed the lion, he looked at the lion he had torn apart and saw a swarm of bees and some honey in, in the head of the lion. So he scooped out some of the honey with his hands and he eats it. It was from this he comes up with this little riddle in Judges 14, 14, out of the eater come forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. There's a picture here. Instead of being eaten by the lion, Samson obtained something sweet to eat. And from this strong predator that had come against him, he received something good. What's the spiritual truth for us today? Out of every evil and negative thing that is thrown at you, God can make something literally sweet for you. The giants can be as bread to you. Your situations can be as bread. Those weapons that are formed against you can come out to be a really good thing for you. The Bible, you know, says in places that even your mistakes will prosper in the end if you believe him. God will turn every bitter adversary into sweet honey for you. Romans 8, 28 in the Amplified, we are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together, together are fitting into a plan for good 
to and for those who love God. Hallelujah. All things. All things. You know, whatever team sports you follow, whether it's uh, basketball, football, if you follow any sports at all, especially basketball, football, even baseball, defense is vital. Uh, usually without a, with a, without a good defense, you're not a very good team, unless you're the Kansas City Chiefs. Otherwise, you're not a good team. <laughs> defense alone doesn't win championships. It keeps you alive in the game. It keeps you in contention. The prayer of protection in Psalm 91, what we've gone over, we've, we've done 12 verses. We're on verse 13 this week has many defensive elements. We've talked about the dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, sh abiding under the shadow of the, you're in, abiding in His shadow, you're dwelling in His secret place of the Most High, uh, you're taking refuge under His wings. A lot of it is defensive. But now that we've covered the defensive end, let's talk about offense. There are times and seasons when the best thing to do is to take cover and allow yourself to be sheltered by God, and he will do it. He is our safe house, our hiding place. Proverbs 18.10, you guys remember this song? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Come on, Marty, sing it with me. The righteous run into... And they are safe. You guys remember that song? Old song. My mom used to play it on the auto harp. She was up there with 14 people in the congregation, and I was running the overhead projector. Trying to, and, and, and I didn't, I didn't have, um, I didn't have a, a list of the songs because she wanted to be led by the Spirit. I just had a big folder with all those transparencies in there. So I get the name of the song, the name of the, oh, the name, the name, the name of the Lord, name of the Lord, name of the Lord. I was like 13. And if I didn't have that song up in 30 seconds, I would feel my dad stare <laughs> in the front row. You playing the auto harp? <laughs> it was good. Psalm 91, 13. I wasn't a happy 13-year-old at that time. Welcome to Living Word. I was handing out programs. Welcome to Living Word. Welcome to Living Word. Welcome to Living Word. So I've been a greeter before. I know it's like a greeter. <laughs> Psalm 91, 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under your feet. It's talking about an offensive position. It's talking about taking your authority. In the Gospel of Luke, you see Jesus sending out 70 disciples against the kingdom of darkness. And he said in Luke 10, 3, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Have you ever seen a lamb overpower a wolf? The authority that we're talking about is not our natural authority. Like the lamb, you have no power in and of yourself against the wolf. The authority we're talking about is supernatural authority that comes from Jesus, just as the strength that enabled Samson to tear apart the lion. It was a supernatural strength. As, as a Christian, you have supernatural authority that comes from Jesus Christ. And all the portrayals of Samson, I've seen, he's always depicted as almost like Arnold Schwarzenegger looking. I personally believe he was small and skinny, but endued with supernatural power. Watching Samson's take on a lion would have been like watching a lamb on a ferocious wolf and the lamb winning. You may not look it or feel it, but God always uses the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. It says it, 1 Corinthians 127. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And it says in Ecclesiastes 7, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong. It's the Lord who ultimately determines who shall emerge victorious. Amen. And so, 
Wow, I am just cruising through this thing. But if you look at the disciples in Luke 10, 17 through 19, they returned 70 disciples saying, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said to him, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I saw him fall. I saw him fall in the beginning. Behold, I, I, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be, by any means hurt you. That is the authority. Why, do not, why are we not walking in this authority on a regular basis? I believe it's something called Galatianism. Read the book of Galatians, and that should tell you. Matter of fact, even read the first chapter of Galatians and look at what Paul puts a double curse on, and that should tell you why we are not walking, in my opinion. Um, the the fourth, third or fourth sermon in this series we saw in Romans 16, 20, uh, uh, declared that the God of peace will crush Satan. And do you remember where he'll be crushed? According to Romans 16, under your feet. Under your feet. So don't put the devil on a pedestal as if he has dominion over you. If he had dominion over you, you would not be sitting right here, right now. You would have died, he would have killed you, he wouldn't have let you be here. He cannot control everything you do. His proper place is not to rule over you, but be beneath your feet. And the Bible is very consistent and always puts the devil underneath your feet. Even going back to Genesis 3.15, it started, 3, 15, it started talking about, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's going to crush his head. It's going to be under his feet. Ephesians 1.22, he's put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to who? Who's the head? The church. And all these things are supposed to be under our feet. You are not at the mercy of the devil. One, Ephesians 1.21, you're far above. These are ranks of demons right here. Study it out. All principality, power, might, and dominion. You're above it. It says it all over it. Psalm 91, 13, and every lion and serpent you shall trample under your feet. This is what Psalm 91, 13 is talking about. Amen. Can I interject a little bit? Yes. Okay. Um, talking about being under our feet and remembering that the weapon, did you go through the weapons, or I mean through the armor yet? No. Okay, I'll wait then. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> you, you, can, you can come with it now if you want. I can come with it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, because if we remember the armor, our, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so all of this trampling and the, the treading, it's in peace and it's in that covenant of peace. And I think that that is like the biggest weapon that we don't even acknowledge. You know, we're always looking for the mighty, the, the strong, the loud, the, you know, the powerful, but it's our peace. And um, I mean, I even know like in modern day armies, their footwear, what they're wearing on their feet is one of their most important things. Um, if, if their footwear is messed up, if their feet are, are you know, nasty, <laughs> you know, then it's going to affect how they're able to fight. And so I just think that that's a, a very, very important thing. And I love that the image of it, it's like we are stepping on it, but it's in peace, you know, because you might get excited about it and you want to do a, <clears throat> but it's a peace. You serpent. Oh, is that how it's done? <laughs> okay. Um, Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, where you're going to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. It's all defensive except the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's all defensive. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is the only offensive piece. We did a whole, we did a lot of weeks on, on the armor. Uh, it seemed like back in the spring, maybe. And that's why for every round of the attack the devil launched at Jesus, he always fought back with what? 
It is written. It is written. It is written. Yeah. We're not. Go he ahead. He was standing in peace too. Huh? He was. Standing he was probably, in peace. probably very peaceful he when was. he said it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I just know when you're not in peace, I mean, and your heart is beating so fast and it's like so loud in your heart that you can't even hear. And it's like, I just, it's an important thing. Have your peace and then speak the word from that peace. Yeah. Well, it says in, in Philippians, when you pray, you know, when you stand praying, um, you, you have to, you have to enter without worry, right? It's best to pray without a bunch of worry, but it's still okay to pray if you're worrying. Yeah, yeah, it is. It All right. Is. It is. And so listen, I, we've run into a number of people here the last few months where they run into these situations and they meet with us and, and they've been going here in each case, it, the, per, the people said 10 years and, um, um, you know, it, I'm not talking about it. It doesn't matter if it's doctors, bankers, news media, you know, take your place of authority. Jesus told Peter, hey, Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. All right. You know what he said then? Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Mm -hmm. Here's the keys to the kingdom, Peter. He also said the strong man, he called him the strong man. If you bind him, you kick him out right? And it remains empty. He's going to come back and check. And if it's empty, he's coming back with seven more that are stronger than him. Amen. All right. He's not going to leave you alone. It says to bind the strong man. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. There's a book called prayers that avail much. Um, it's kind of an old school book. And, uh, you know, part of what we read in the offering, what we prayed is a prayer out of that book. It's called Deliverance from Satan and His Demonic Forces. You don't, you don't have to have a, a sheet of paper. You know, um, I'm going to take you through this prayer because I do a form of this every day. I, I don't do this whole thing, but what we're talking about is using the word to your advantage as the sword of the spirit. And, you know, in the book, Prayers That Avail Much, the scripture references are all at the bottom of the page. I added a little bit to this just to help me, but it, you know, just to walk through it, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come boldly to your throne of grace, present. I, I always say, you know, Paul used to say, I do not cease to pray. He says, I do not cease to pray making mention of you in my prayers. He mentions you. It counts if you mention them. Yep. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for me, Jamie, Hayden, Kristen, John, Becky, Jesse, and Elena. I pray I go through each person. I go through even the pets. I go through the pets. I go through our cars, houses. It's just what I do. I make mention. I make mention of families in this church, all right? And I stand in the gap and intercede on behalf of us. I say, he knows what I'm talking about, knowing that the Holy Spirit within me takes hold together with me against the evils that would attempt. They are attempting to hold us in bondage. We unwrap ourselves from the bonds of wickedness with our prayers. We take our shield of faith. We quench every fiery dart the adversary would bring against us. You say, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. You tell us to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. So then we, so then we get to it. Ready? Go to the next slide. So we speak to you, Satan. And all, these are demons. In the, these are all scriptures right, right here that we're confessing. Uh, to, and to the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places, and demonic spirits. And, you know, we have a copy of this out there in the lobby at the uh, guest services table, right on the lobby. If you want to get a copy of this whole thing, you can get it. But at this point, it says name the spirits. Do you have to name the spirits? No, you don't have to name the spirits. I'm not into naming the spirits, but it helps me. It helps me. All this stuff is in the Bible. All right, let's go. So that's, this is at the bottom of the page, all right, or on the back side of this page. You flip it over. I'm talking about the spirit of accusation. You know someone can have an uh, accusatory spirit? Have you ever seen someone with a critical accusatory spirit? A spirit of condemnation. There's a spirit behind condemnation. There's a spirit behind someone that's always embarrassed. There's a spirit of intimidation. I once was once was told I had that 
chasing, chasing me around. A spirit of revenge, a vengeful spirit, the unloving spirit, spirit of self-pity, addiction, confusion, a Jezebel spirit, jealousy, oppression, self-deception, unforgiveness, deceit and lying spirit, a spirit of covetousness, fear, pride, poverty. A lot of these work together and are always together. Usually if there's pride, there's fear behind it, poverty, self-hate, worry, anger, infirmity, and there's generational curses, uh, spirits behind that, lust, rebellion, strife. There's a spirit of bitterness, definitely, a depression, narcissism, murder, rejection, suicide. It's all spirits, you know? And I just name them. I name them. I don't always name them, all right? But sometimes I name them, and it helps to remind me it helps to remind me about what's out there, right? And then I pop back to that, that original, once I name them, okay? I go back to where we left off, and I said, I take authority over you. You don't have to scream it. I take authority over you, and I bind you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and I loose you from your assignments on me, my family, our ministries, marriages, reputations, every piece and part of our lives. You walk today. And I do a form of that every day. Because you know what? I'm weird enough to take a little personal poll. To do, it, do that prayer for six months and not do that prayer for six months. All right? And I did the prayer for six months and I thought, I'm going to try not doing the prayer for six months. And after about two months after that, not doing that prayer, there were so many things going on. And I was so at wit's end. I, started, I didn't even last three months. I started doing the prayer again. Right? And a little bit every day, and it doesn't have to be this long, because this thing goes on. I mean, if you really want to punch him in the mouth, all right, after you, you loose the ministering spirits of God, come forth, all right, there's more. Let's, let's go to the next one. It's all scripture. I lay hold of my salvation and my confession of the Lordship of Jesus. I speak of things that are not as though they were. I choose to look at the unseen and eternal things of God. I say Satan shall not, shall not get an advantage over me. I'm not ignorant of his devices. I resist him, and he has to flee in terror from me in the name of Jesus. I give him no place in me. I plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus over us in every area of our lives because Satan and his cohorts are overcome by that blood in your word. This is scripture. I thank you, Father, that I tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy in our behalf. It just, and, and really, if you there's a, it's, it's all scripture. Is there another one? We are delivered from the powers of darkness and translated into the kingdom of your dear son. Fill the vacant places on the inside of us with your redemption, your word, your Holy Spirit, your love, your wisdom, your righteousness, and your revelation knowledge in the name of Jesus. I'm just saying, and, and, and no, it's, it's not a formula, okay? All right? It's not, I'm just saying it works for me. It works for me, and it's scriptural, and someone's put it in a book out there called Prayers That Avail Much. The old timers believed in it, you know, and just to kind of back it up, this book called Spiritual Warfare by Grace Ryerson Roos, um, it was really cool how I came across this lady because they accidentally delivered a stack of books to me that were not supposed to come to me, all from this lady. I think they were from my mom. And they put them down on my desk, and she never saw any of the books. Isn't that terrible? I just kept the books. I just kept the books and never told her. All kinds of great books. Books I like. Books, bo books with only 26 pages. That's my kind of book. All right? I'll do a 26-page book. But I love this story. She says, God wanted me to fight the enemy. On, this is what we're talking about. This type of prayer is what, what she's talking about. God wanted me to fight the, okay. Years ago, a mother came to me to pray about a situation in her family. I promised to, but I went to prayer and began to take authority over the works of the devil. And the Lord said, this is not your battle. He refused to let me stand for her. God was requiring that this mother fight her own battle, and when she did not, she was not delivered. The word says, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, but the Lord will not permit someone else to bear a burden. He intends we should shoulder ourselves. He has no hothouse plants. 
He exposes all trees, all the trees of his planting to the winds and storms of trial and testing and seeks to put strength in us by teaching us the efficacy of his atoning blood and the power that lies in the word of our testimony. He would share the keys of the kingdom with us and let us bind and loose to the consternation of the devil. You know, she says, if we were standing, if we were in a burning building and we knew of a fire escape at hand that would lead us safely out, wouldn't we be absolute fools to stand and cry to God to deliver us when we could go to an exit and walk down the fire escape to safety? Would it be God's fault or a failure of his promises if we perished in the flames? No, we refused to avail ourselves of the way of escape and so suffered the consequences. A very precious saint under this teaching, sat under this teaching for several years. She resisted partaking of the truth that binding and loosing power had been granted unto her. She never did exercise these weapons. Grace calls these weapons. She even mentioned that she got her prayers answered on a regular basis. The day came when her lovely daughter for whom she had such great plans, ran away with a married man. Just before this, the Lord in his faithfulness to her had me to renew to her the teaching of the authority of the believer. But again, she turned away from it. Time passed. She managed to accept the situation concerning her daughter, but the enemy who had not been bound was having a field day. He was not through with her. Next, her husband, who had lived so faithfully for God up to that point, backslid. In the process of time, the devil still loose to do anything he desired, separated them, a divorce went through, and he married another woman. Did God fail her? No doubt she prayed and prayed fervently, but prayer will not substitute for rising up in the name of Jesus and binding the power of the devil to play havoc with your life. See, and I, th I thought, you know what, this is perfect because we've had these counseling appointments in the last couple months and people were like, no, I've never heard of that. Like I pulled out that prayer because I'm not a counselor. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna help you uh, like a psychologist or a psychiatrist would. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you spiritual advice is it. I'm gonna say, this is how you pray. That's all I'm gonna do, all right? I'm not gonna try to get in your head and find out what your dad did to you. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna do that, all right? And so, and these people, they knew, they'd been coming here for 10 years, knew nothing about this. Nothing about this. And so I thought, you know what? The next time I get a chance to work that in, I'm gonna work that in. Well, this week, you shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shall you trample under your feet. And she goes on to say, God did not fail her, she prayed and prayed fervently, but the prayer will not substitute for rising up in the name of Jesus and binding the power of the devil to play havoc. God has provided the weapons and the truth and the knowledge to apply them, but we refuse the armor and the weapons and stand in our burning building calling on God to deliver us because we refuse to take the way of this escape. It must indeed grieve the heart of God to watch such wasteful destruction of his precious children, and yet he must also wonder at our sought ways that will not bend to obey him. Those are strong words. Yes, here we go. You ready? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, we've talked about it before, how Jim and I, our relationship is just so different with the Lord. And I mean, he, he does do this and he keeps track of it. And it's like, I just don't have that. That's just not how I am with the Lord. And there's been times where I, I get condemned about it. And I think I'm not as close to God as he is, or I'm not, you know, doing all the things that I'm supposed to do, but he just, he just tells me we're good. He tells me we're good because I don't think that there's a day that goes by that he isn't telling me something to do, but I don't have like my stack of like, this is what I do every day, you know? But it's like, he's so big and he's in me. And I know that, I mean, I'm still developing and I'm still learning so many things, but it's like, I, I believe in being quiet with him and listening rather than me going and saying, I'm gonna do all of these things and this is what I'm telling you, Lord. I just wait, I wait. 
and I, I mean, I lift things to him, and then I see, what does he want me to do? And there are times where it's like, there's something on that, and I want you to take authority over that. Or he'll say, I want you to plead the blood of Jesus over that, but I, I don't do it like three times a day, or I don't do it, I just, it's like I, I try to do it at, at a prompt, you know, like when the Lord tells me. And I'm not saying I've got it all right or he's got it all right. I just want you guys to know that there just are different ways. You know, God speaks to each of us in our own way. And it's all good. Just keep connecting to him how he connects to you. And, and you're good. Don't take my formula or his formula as like what you have to do. You just get with the Lord, and you'll develop just a beautiful relationship, and it'll be special because it'll be yours and his. So that's all I want. Listen, it's, it's, it's the same way with the Word. I mean, like, my son studies it. He studies it. I don't study it. I listen to it. I'm, a better, I'm better at listening, and then I, I say it. I might say one one or two things a day, all day, just run it through my mind, you know? Where, where he's not into that, you know, he's not into that, he likes to study it and find things. Everybody does it different, do you get what I'm saying? Everyone receives different. There's not, there's, it's not gonna be the same way for everyone, but you do take your authority, you do bind and loose. I just figured out, for me, I do it every day, I know it has power, I cover, I cover my family before it comes. Because I know he's forming stuff anyways, might as well just hit him now. Not wait till it comes, and then start doing it. And, and, and so 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He has to seek those out whom he may devour. He just can't walk up and get anyone he wants. He can't have anyone. Don't surrender your authority to him because in the end, if you do, he will devour you. If you do nothing, he will devour you. Did you notice he roams around about like or as a roaring lion? Why does he go about as a roaring lion and not some other creature? Why did he choose a lion? Well, in Proverbs 19, 12, the, it says the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion. The devil is a, a, an imposter. He goes about as a roaring lion because he's imitating the king of kings. Jesus is the real lion of Judah. He wants people to think that our king is full of wrath and anger and rage against us. He wants that so bad. He wants you thinking God is disappointed. God is mad. God is mad at you. He comes at, at roaring with the voice of condemnation, accusation, shame. We've all heard that roar before. Satan wants you to have the impression that God is angry with you, that if you have failed him, and that he's at, in the very least disappointed with you. Now think about this for one second here. Think about this. If you believe that about God, would, would you be taking refuge under the shelter of his wings? If you believe that about it? Probably not. Would you be taking your rightful place of power and strength? No, you'll, you'll wind up running from God. The chances are low that believers who are under a cloud of constant condemnation will pray, even pray the prayer of protection. If you're condemned, they feel unworthy of God's promises and are expecting punishment and judgment. And that's where the devil wants you to be. When you run away from God, you're running straight into his snare. You abdicate your place of authority when you abdicate your place of intimacy with God. You need to know you're loved. God is not mad at you. In Christ, you have, the, you have confident assurance that you're forgiven, loved, and righteous. You know, just to take this, I take this whenever I can. Because I always meet people, oh, I've been here three months. I've been here you know, six months. You know, I meet tons of people like that. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin. He made him to be sin. Christ who knew no sin. He had never sinned. Never lingered on a thought long enough for it to count as a sin. Think about that. Never worried, never feared, Never did 57 and a 55 and broke the laws of the land. Never exaggerated. 
never, never ate two plates of nachos. <laughs> at, where, where's that place with the habanero sauce? Uh, El Rodeo. Yeah, at El Rodeo or El Rodeo. <laughs> never committed gluttony. Never did anything that wasn't in faith. Never sinned. He who knew no sin became sin so that in and through him we might become. This is what you are. Endued with and viewed as being in an example of the righteousness of God. Not what you really are. Not the guy that does 85 all over the cities. Viewed as. He, this is, it's called a great exchange. He exchanged, he took on every sin we'll ever commit and gave you a gift of righteousness. It's a gift. It's not something you achieve. E.W. Kenyon wrote a book called Two Kinds of Righteousness. Why? Because there's two kinds of righteousness in the Bible. There's New Testament righteousness. There's Old Testament righteousness. When you see the word righteousness in the New Testament, it means cleared from all guilt. It does not mean how good you personally are. It also means, it also means, according to E.W. Kenyon, the ability to stand before God without any guilt or inferiority. You can go before God and you no inferior, no guilt, nothing. That's what he says, that New Testament word righteousness means. And, and he says, listen to this. We might become the righteousness of God, what we ought to be. Not what you are. He views you how you ought to be. It's a gift that you have to constantly be accepting, at least daily or weekly. Approved and acceptable and right relationship with him. He took all your punishment at the cross so that today you can enjoy that gift. And the ones that are successful, and I just think we miss this. This is the basis of Christianity. This exchange is the basis of you being saved. And people just, oh, it's, it's basic. But they don't understand what they really have. Imagine if you really had that, what Jesus had. That perfection in every realm. And, and it says, Romans 5, 17, and, and I know you guys get these with me, but Romans 5, 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive an abundance of grace. But in order to receive an abundance of undeserved favor, you have to receive the gift of righteousness. And both of these, these things are not just once. You have to be aware of them. You have to know that you can get them on a regular basis. If you study it in the Greek, the gift of righteousness, those are the ones that reign. Not, it doesn't say the Christians that sin the least are the ones that reign. No, it doesn't say that. It says those that know how to receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness are the ones that reign in this life. All right? And so but he took all your punishment. He sees you as in Christ who is completely spotless and without blame. I know that's hard for us to get. Based on our own deeds, none of us qualify for this kind of protection, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, you can come, you, what do you do when you mess up? Sin is defined in the Greek language as missing the mark. Hebrews 4, 16, you come fearlessly, confidently, boldly. Why? Because you're righteous. Because you know how he views you. Because you know he's not holding anything against you. Because you know he wants to bless you. And you come, you draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor. To what? To us sinners, the writer calls himself. That we may receive mercy for what? When you failed. So you're, what are you supposed to do now? You're actually supposed to go to God when you mess up so that you can receive not getting the bad things you deserve. That's what mercy is. Not getting the bad things you have coming to you. That's what you can receive when you mess up. It's telling you what to do. And find grace. What's that? 
things you don't deserve and get good things you don't deserve. He's saying, no, when you mess up, you come right to me and I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to make sure you don't get the bad things you deserve and I'm going to make sure you get good things that you, that you don't deserve. He's telling you what to do and we just gloss over that. But you have to understand about your gift of righteousness. I know you're ready to go, aren't you? Okay. No, go ahead. No. We're good. Well, I think that that's really interesting because, um, like, I was trying to find, like, okay, where do we where do we run into the lion and the adder? I mean, where is this? And um, in Isaiah 30, um, we read it was when Judah was being warned a bit against joining with Egypt, uh, which is basically disobedience, you know, going towards disobedience. So it says, "Woe! Judgment is coming to the rebellious children," declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine and make an alliance by pouring out a libation, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me. How many of us have done that? Yep. <laughs> to take refuge in the stronghold of Pharaoh, to take shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety and protection of Pharaoh will be your shame, the refuge in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation and disgrace. A mournful, inspired oracle, a burden to be carried concerning the beasts of the Negev. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come lioness and lion, viper and fiery flying serpent. They carry their riches on the, on the shoulders of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people, the Egyptians, who cannot benefit them. So this is where we see the lion and the adder is in disobedience. But God is saying here in Psalm 91 that we're going to trample them under our foot. So even when we are in disobedience, in, in doing the things that we know well we're not supposed to be doing, he's still the God of mercy. He's the God of even if. Even if you mess up, even if I will deliver you, I've given you this covenant of peace that, you know, you can trample on the lion and the adder. And I mean, I just was having, I was Googling today, like that's the best way to prepare for a sermon, right, is Google. <laughs> but um, so I was just like looking up, like how does a lion attack? Um, lions have small hearts and so they're not fast and they're not built for endurance. So they basically will either stalk their prey or they'll ambush them. Um, and they're not very successful, honestly. The one way that they can succeed is if the, the prey looks away and it's like loses their attention. It's like that's the one time that they can be successful and it's not even that often. But what they'll do is they knock the prey off their feet, our gospel of peace. They steal your peace and then they go for your mouth. Seriously. With their mouth. With their mouth. They put their mouth over the prey's mouth. Is that powerful or what? The devil wants to silence you. He wants to take that out of you. And so when the enemy, he'll just, he'll knock you down, steal your peace, and make you quiet. It's huge. That's good. Wasn't Isn't... there something about the, getting them on the run? Oh, yeah. There's a lot here. Okay. Um, so they'll, the most often, they'll attack you in the middle of the day, too. People think that, you know, oh, it's, you know, we're in the light, it's all good, but it's just like, you know, no, they'll come at you. They, um, let's see, and one of the things that said how to survive a lion attack, <laughs> this is just Google. This is like basic nature, you know, like, I don't know, I can't remember what site I was on. It says, it is vital to stand your ground perhaps retreating very slowly, but continue facing the lion while clapping your hands, shouting and waving your arms around to make yourself look bigger. Most charges are mock charges, so you'll usually be fine. And remember, hold your ground, never run or turn your back. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Wow. I know, I thought that was so cool. So that's just like natural knowledge, so yeah. Just uh don't let him steal your peace and just keep talking and praising. Okay, and then snakes. It said that there's snakes in this. When we're in disobedience, we might hit a snake. Okay, and snakes attack. They try to immobilize their prey by either injecting a venom that causes paralysis or by constricting them and smothering them or they eat them alive. And then, okay, there's this website. It's called The Art of Manliness. <laughs> I have referred to it several times because um, there's just things that I, I do around the house and I don't know how to do it. So she I, knows I won't be doing it. Yeah, so I look it up on the art of manliness and figure out how to do it. So this is that what... That makes me look real good. Thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry. We'll just, we'll just be honest with you. They're, none of the Hammonds are mechanically inclined. My brother is. Mac, me, my son. Mm. Okay. We, don't, 
we, it's fine. Yeah. You are good at so many. But other that's things. why I married her. She's mechanically. But you're quiet. good at so okay. many other things. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, oh thank you. You are. No, but, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking for that right now. That's good. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Can I talk about yeah. the, the yes, snakes yes. though? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, this is like basic knowledge too. How to avoid snake bites. I actually Googled that phrase, how to avoid a snake bite. And there's an answer in the art of manliness. You avoid tall grass, stay on the trail. Be alert, remember that snakes can climb too. Don't stick your hand in a dark hole. <laughs> snakes can still bite you even when they're dead, so don't pick up a dead snake. They might look dead, but they actually might not be. Don't make your camp in snake territory. <laughs> and be sure to zip up your tent. Wear protective pants and boots. Again, your peace. Keep your peace. Okay, and then what do you do when you're bitten? This is still on the art of manliness. <laughs> but I believe it's biblical. I love it. Wash it immediately. If you get bitten, you just wash it with the word. You speak the word. Stay calm. The more you move, the faster your heart beats, the quicker the venom is going to be circulated through your body. So stay calm. And it says, don't suck it out. You've seen it in the movies, you know, where they're like, suck it out. Don't put it in your mouth. It says, don't suck it out. Don't let the venom in your mouth. Is that wisdom or what? I just loved it. I thought this is like really practical things that are like helping this like stick to me. But I want to go back to Isaiah 30 when it's talking about when we're in this place and we see the lion and the, and the snakes. All oh, right, um, I can't remember what verse this is. I think it's 15. Um, For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said this, in returning to me and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confident trust is your strength. But you were not willing, and you said, no, we'll flee on horses, therefore you'll flee from your enemies. And you said, we'll ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you shall be swift too. But then jump to Isaiah 18, or 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord waits expectantly, and he longs to be gracious to you. He's still merciful, you guys. He's the God of even if. He's the God of mercy. Therefore, he waits to, on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who long for him, since he will never fail them. O people in Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will most certainly be gracious to you at the sound of your cry for help. When he hears it, he will answer you. And then verse 21, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And whenever you turn to the right or to the left, he's there. And so I love that. In this Psalm 91, we're even addressing this God of mercy who is like, even if you see the lion, you see the snake, because you're in disobedience, you still got victory over it. You still have the upper hand. Just keep your peace. Proverbs 19, 12, the king's wrath is as a ro the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as, as, as dew upon the grass. God's wrath against our sins was satisfied on the cross. Today, we are beneficiaries of his favor. The Hebrew word for favor, if we could put that slide up. That's what it means, pleasure, delight, goodwill, acceptance. You know, Isaiah 54 comes after Isaiah 53. We talked about this last week. It is the benefits of what Jesus did at the cross. Isaiah 53 goes in detail of what Jesus was going to go through on the cross. It says in Isaiah 54, 8, and then we talked about this last week. I think it's for people in here because there's still a lot of people, popular people out there preaching this. I just saw this about, about the, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. One of the most popular preachers in the country. And I'm just, I just don't agree because the scripture's like this. This is a new covenant prophecy right here. He says, in a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee. Saith the Lord thy redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. This is like Noah. I said I'd never flood the earth again. Remember I said that? That's what he's saying about this. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor ever rebuke thee. Just like he did with Noah, I'll never flood the earth again. I'll never be mad at you again, and I'll never rebuke you again. Amen. Well, explain that one to me down there in Texas? Explain it. 
This is not just to the Jews. You know, Isaiah, if you know anything about it, it's split. It's really interesting. 66 chapters. How many books are in the, how many books are in the whole, whole Bible? Oh, what a coincidence. How many books in the Old Testament? 39. And people think at Isaiah 40, there's another writer because the whole thing changes at 40. Well, 40 is when the New Testament starts. It's not coincidental. And so, but you know, all this, it's talking about no weapon formed against you is going to prosper in this chapter because your righteousness is of the Lord. You have the Lord's gift of righteousness at this time. That's how no weapon formed against you prospers. And so our place of protection was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. In him you have been made righteous and all the blessings of the righteous, including protection, provision, length of days, is your inheritance. Amen. You know what an inheritance is? You just get it. Right. You get it. It happens. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, he's praying in verse 18, have the eyes of our hearts flooded with light so we can know and understand the hope which he has called you and how rich is his inheritance. He's praying for you to have wisdom. You're gonna need wisdom to understand what you really got from the cross. Most of us don't even know. This whole righteousness thing, this whole protection thing. You know, we, we, he's, Paul's saying, give us wisdom. This is what you pray for each other, Christians, wisdom. So you can understand what you're supposed to do, the hope to which you have been called, and the riches of the glory of your inheritance. So, do you have anything else as, as, we, as we close here? Because I'm like, wow. I mean, I, you know, I cannot finish. I cannot do you, have, do you have anything else? Um, no, I, I like what you're doing. Before we do the prayer of protection, I will just say this, what I was going to go into. Well, you say all the, all the apostles were murdered. No, they weren't murdered. Read, read the Faith Hall of Fame. They were offered deliverance and turned it down. They were offered deliverance and turned it down Paul said, I want to go, but I can't go. I want to go, but I can't go. And then he says in Timothy, now it's time for me to go. I'm going to go. In other words, he talks as if he had power over life and death. They allowed themselves to be martyred, right? And there's, I have scripture backing it up, but can we, can we, can we confess Psalm 91 together? Yes. All right, before um, I do a, a salvation call to close the service. Um, you guys ready? And remember, I, I, I took it and I just changed the pronouns in it so it, it personalizes it. Right. Yep. So you're saying it about, we're saying it about us in agreement. Are you ready? Yep. Because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We will say of the Lord, He is our refuge and our fortress, our God, and you do we trust. Surely you shall deliver us from the snare of the fowler, from the noise and pestilence. You shall cover us with your feathers and under your wings shall we trust. Your truth shall be our shield and buckler. We shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at our sides and 10,000 at our right hands but it shall not come near us. Only with our eyes shall we behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because we have made you, the Lord, our refuge, even the Most High, our habitation. No evil shall befall us, neither shall any plague come near our dwelling. For you shall give your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. His angels shall bear us up in their hands lest we dash our feet against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon, shall we trample under our feet. Because we have set our love upon you, you will deliver us, 
will set us on high just because we know your name. We shall call upon you and you will answer us. You will be with us in trouble. You will deliver us and you will honor us. With long life, will you satisfy us and show us your salvation? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.